Well, good afternoon. Um, I am here with George Kenny Jr., a Republican who represented the 170th District, portions of Montgomery and Philadelphia counties from 1985 to 2008. Welcome. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, what I'd like to do is start out by asking you about your background, tell me about where you grew up, uh, and then going into your education. I uh, always grew up in the city of Philadelphia, in the uh, Somerton section of uh, Philly which is uh, way up in northeast, right on the Bucks County and Montgomery County borders. Uh, one of eight children. Uh, father was a city worker, my mom was a homemaker, so a uh, very active household. Uh, and uh, attended LaSalle High School and graduated from LaSalle College. Worked my way through LaSalle College. I guess uh, Started my political career probably by the age of 14, working for a, a neighbor, Jim Mellinson, who was running for city council. So that was my first experience giving out literature and, and what have you. Uh, and from there became a committee man at 18. Uh, as I said, working through uh, LaSalle College, uh, working for McNeil Pharmaceutical, a division at Johnson & Johnson. Had attended uh, Drexel uh, and then uh, left Drexel and took a uh, job at McNeil and then went to Drexel Night School and that the commute was too far from Somerton to Drexel from Somerton to work to Drexel and so I then transferred to LaSalle and got my degree from LaSalle um, in 1982 so I graduated from high school in 75 so it was since it was a work study program, it took a little longer, but I had no, uh, had no college loans. Uh, McNeil had paid the, for all my college. Uh, once you got a C or better, they took care of you. And I did that So that, and uh, went into their sales force. Was there anyone else in your family that was in politics? My, uh, my dad was a city worker, worked for the, uh, for the city. Uh, I, his dad uh, was a war leader, with the, a Republican war leader, uh, until he died in like 1951. Uh, so he was involved in, in city politics. And at that time, all the to get a city job, was, patronage was a, uh, alive and well in the city of Philadelphia in the uh, 40s, 50s. Uh, so my dad had gotten a city job at the, uh, with the Board of Revision. So there was politics always around our family, but no one really, um, except for my grandfather who died in the early 50s. Uh, since then, maybe my grandmother may have been a committee woman for a little bit, but uh, she went to work for the courts when my grandfather died. Uh, so it was politics. We were always political, and uh, Republican politics. Well, I was just going to say, what influences would you say shaped um, you into becoming a Republican? I would say my, my, my parents. Uh, it was almost we uh, we always jokingly asked our parents, were we were we Republicans or Catholics first? We weren't sure what. <laughs> I mean, because it was uh, my dad had a, as I said, it was a patronage job, uh, and we just always were Republican. I mean, it was just something we were. I mean, I don't, there was not much discussion. I mean, it was just the way it was, and. Uh, uh, I believe even to this day all eight of us are still, my parents are deceased, but we're all still Republicans. So why eventually did you run for the House as opposed to another office? So I was a uh, committee man at the age of 18. Uh, I said graduated from college, started, uh, was with, still with McNeil Pharmaceutical, went into their sales force. I was 26 and uh, Hank Salvatore was our state rep. And I'd always seen Representative Salvatore throughout the neighborhood, and uh, it was a Republican district, even though it was the city. Very few districts were still Republican in 1984, and he decided he was going to run for the state senate. And I thought to myself, here I am, 26. Uh, my future wife Liz and I were dating at the time. We met in 1980. And I remember saying to my dad, you know, if I'm going to try this elective office, an opportunity is here. Uh, I said, you know, Mr. Salvatore is going to run for the Senate. Maybe I'd like to consider running for the House. And he said, you got to be out of your mind, he said. 
He said, you should stay in the pharmaceutical business, make money, and don't get involved in all that nonsense. Because he, and I think Jesse, from being where he came from, he saw what happened to people as, as a patronage employee. He saw how people get, uh, I'll be kind, and where they, they didn't just wind up where they were supposed to for just because of purely political reasons. So he said just, I think he was advocating as a good father, saying go out, make money, don't get involved in all this, at least not at that level, elect, maybe be a contributor, be part of the business of politics, just don't be the, uh, the politician. But right. I decided, one of the many times I didn't listen to my dad, and uh, so I was elected uh, in 1984, and uh, 24 years later, and you're still here. Still here. Did you enjoy campaigning? It was, uh, I remember the first campaign, 1984, it was uh, Senator Hank Salvatore said, raise five to $10,000, listen to me, and don't worry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we raised about 40000 that year in 84, so it took a lot more money. And the enjoyment, what, what attracted me to the job was, you know, you represent your neighborhood. As I said, I grew up in this neighborhood uh, Summerton, which was the dominant community in, in the district. Uh, so campaigning, it was like, you know, I knew everybody from, from growing up, going to the church there, St. Chris Church and Summerton Youth. So that was the dominant part of the district. Uh, so yeah, it was enjoyable to you know, go out door to door. And I thought it'd be exciting to represent, you know, what better job than to represent your neighbors and your community. And that, that's what excited me and, was, uh, and still excites me today. Speaking of your district, can you describe for me the 170th district in both geography and the constituents? Uh, middle class, working class neighborhoods. It was um, before 2002. So from 84 to 2002, it was uh, Summerton, as I said, Bustleton in the 58th ward uh, from ward politics, which was on the... Uh, in Northeast Philadelphia and part of the 66th Ward, which were the communities of Parkwood and Normandy. Uh, predominantly a Catholic community, mm -hmm. uh, large Jewish population in Northeast Philadelphia. I probably had more uh, Feder Jewish Federation housing than any uh, district in Northeast Philadelphia, so it was a large uh, Jewish population. Uh, 2002, uh, Everything seemed to change. Uh, uh, 92 was okay. Didn't, my district didn't change much. 2002, uh, Majority Leader Purzell barely won his election in Northeast Philly, won by like 90 votes in 2000. Uh, and then everything got <laughs> moved around. And uh, uh, during that reapportionment year, uh, Representative Wogan, who represented the district that bordered me, uh, uh, became a judge. So he became a sitting judge in common police court. So that's when a district I always had in, in the city of Philadelphia uh, then became a, a district in Northeast Philly to, uh, I had to pick up two voting divisions in Montgomery County to get below the new Purzell seat uh, he needed a new seat to be competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, so the world changed in 2002. It became a much more, uh, much different district then. What were some of the issues that, uh, that were very important to your constituents? Uh, initially, it was always taxes. As a, as a Northeast Philadelphia representative, I mean, we, Harrisburg was in another world. So it was always City Hall. And they knew Washington, but it was always a, a fight with City Hall. We were always the forgotten communities in, in, in the city. Um, and in those years, uh, Hank Salvatore, my predecessor, who went to the Senate, his campaign issue was always secession. He wanted to break off from the city of Philadelphia, our section of Northeast Philly. Even though my constituency uh, supported the concept, it really never became, it was never put to the voters. So. Uh, taxes and reinvestment in city tax dollars back to our neighborhoods were, was always the dominant issue. The one thing I um, had was I had one huge state property, the Philadelphia State Hospital. Okay. 
which early in my career, uh, Governor uh, Casey in 1986 had come in and started a movement to close down the hospital, uh, which was, I don't say a bad idea, but you're talking about a huge piece of property, uh, 200 and some acres, uh, and now how do we reuse this property? Uh, the last patient left in 1990. Uh, people like to joke that once that issue was resolved, Kenny could stop running for state house. And <laughs> so here we are 24 years later and uh, still 50 acres of ground to develop, but it was time to move on. But that was always the big local issue, the, the Philadelphia State Hospital issue. But taxes were always the dominant, uh, dominant issue, uh, just how the city was reinvesting in us. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, when they always did reassessments of uh, real estate. It was always a huge issue. Besides changing of the district boundaries over your time, have you seen a lot of changes with regards to um, constituents issues um, and anything else that was going on? Well, we have large, uh, with the city populations, we, we've lost a huge, uh, in the city as a whole, mm -hmm. population. What we found in my district is uh, those city workers, I mean, those people that still want to live in the city, mostly city workers, I have a large police, fire, uh, city personnel. It yeah. makes up a large part of my constituency. Uh, and that's the biggest change I've seen. And since the Republican Party hasn't controlled the city of Philadelphia since the early 50s, uh, over time, those voters became more democratic. So a district I would say was maybe 55, 45 when I first ran as a Republican. It was a Republican district. Mm -hmm. uh, we still, even today, only have our only elected city councilman uh, in the city is from my, my area, represents a portion of my area. So you can see that shift out where the, where the political makeup is around 60, 40 democratic. But still the same, uh, make up uh, uh, the working class people and uh, you know, go to work every day, p pay their taxes, uh, very involved, uh, very neighborhood oriented. Uh, and really looking at my, no large industry dominates my, no. we have uh, Nabisco on the Boulevard, which was always a, uh, probably the largest employer in my district, but uh, there was no dominant industry or uh, so nothing, Nothing was held at all together. Sure. It was just uh, most of the people worked, as I said, for the probably for the city, and then commuted to to work outside the district. Tell me about your first impressions uh, when you were first elected and you came to the to the Capitol building. What what was going through your head when during your first swearing-in ceremony or when you first saw the Capitol building itself? Uh, just in all, really, just uh, like I mean. Uh, excitement in the sense of, you know, my, my neighbor sent me here uh, uh, wanting to make sure I did not make mistakes and, uh, <laughs> or at least that my, my biggest fear was embarrassing my neighbors and, and, and mostly doing something stupid or uh, not corrupt so much as just stupid things or where I would make the media for doing something outrageous or stupid or, you know, not paying attention to what was going on. So that was my first. But the Capitol building was just so, uh, I had been up here for a couple of uh, uh, inaugurations with the governor, so I had seen the building, had some idea what was going on, but uh, uh, just a real sense of responsibility uh, when I got here that, hey, now I'm representing not just George Kenny, I'm representing some 60,000 people who I grew up with and I want to make sure I do a great job for them. That no matter whether they like me politically, that I wouldn't, they, uh, and something I was most proud of, they may not have voted for me, but they didn't dislike me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they still respected sure. my, uh, my position. and res I mean, they may not have agreed with me on issues, but still respected me, who I was, and the way I conducted myself on their behalf as their representative. Did you share an office with anyone when you first came? Uh, when I first came it was with Edgar Carlson from Tioga County. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've yet to <laughs> visit Tioga County. Uh, uh, Edgar was from a whole 
from a, a rural district yeah. in the middle of, uh, I guess, the, uh, the nor what they call it, the Grand Canyon of the Northeast, uh, Wellsboro, and still had a, a lighted lamp post in the town, and I don't even know what they have up there. But uh, So Edgar and I shared an office. Uh, it was funny, going back to the politics, my dad said, get to know the other, yeah. uh, you know, meet other legislators, not just the same. Uh, so that's been a great experience, but I shared an office with uh, Edgar Carlson. Do you remember who sat around you when you first sat on the floor? Well, I always, uh, it was always the same. I sat with the Philadelphia delegation. Okay. So when we came up in, uh, when I came up in 84, it was always uh, uh, John Taylor who came with me in 84. He, and I, he was from uh, Northeast Philadelphia also. He had beat a Dem Democrat. I, I won a Republican seat, an open seat. It was always John Taylor, myself, uh, Fran Weston, who Mike McGeehan now has that seat, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Wogan, who became a judge, we, we doing reapportionment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Brazell and I split up that territory. So Brazell, Denny O'Brien, that's six. Yeah, it was. They were the six of us. So we all sat in the back, uh, back of the house, and. Uh, the Democrat side were all the Democrat members from Philly, so we all we always sat in the, in the back of the house. So yeah, it was a. Most of the guys behind me were for, from Allegheny County. Okay. Uh, George Potts and uh, Terry McVeary, and they were some. Uh, and actually, Ben Wilson from Bucks County sat in the last seat in the back. So he had seniority, so I guess he didn't want to be with his Bucks County buddies, but. Um, and that was interesting because my wife's of Bucks County, and so we had that connection. So Ben Wilson, and uh, one of the first committees I asked for was his committee because he chaired finance, though. So. Okay. But that was the group back there. Was there anyone in particular um, that you saw as a mentor when you first started? Uh, probably just all those Philadelphia guys. The, I, I kept close to them. They knew, they knew my district as well as I did. Uh, Senator Salvatore was in the Senate, so I always had him to to lean on. He was in caucus, he was a caucus administrator in the House, uh, so I always had that relationship and uh, just really most of the time just kept an eye on what they were doing. Uh, and you know that's really who I look look toward. Uh, yeah, no, no one in particular. I didn't like hold on to one person and. More of a follow group. anyone around to to know the whereabouts and no we uh, actually uh, uh, when we came in eighty four so eighty five uh, it was uh, Ron Raymond from Delaware County John Taylor uh, Dave Argle mm -hmm. and uh, John Fox we all had a we all shared an apartment so as freshmen we all hung together and uh, that's who we spent most of that first year or two orientation and the the freshmen were always treated as a group more or less right. so that's who we uh, spent most of my time with. Getting into your career in the house then um, uh, you had served on a number of committees during your time here um, consumer affairs finance urban affairs and so on uh, was there one that wasn't particularly your favorite? Probably the finance committee as I getting back to the issue uh, of um, Taxes being an, an important issue in my district. It was always the number one issue whenever we uh, uh, did polling or what have you. And I also looked to my colleagues from Philadelphia. I mean, there was no need for all of us to be on the same. Right. Out of six of us, spread it out. I know um, O'Brien and Wogan, like, o Wogan was a lawyer, and mm -hmm. so he was judiciary, and uh, on the, John Taylor was more of a even more city than me, he, got, he always spent time doing the, uh, the urban, more urban issues. Uh, so I always looked uh, early on to the finance committee. I did seek appropriations. Uh, I know I was trying to think of any of my colleagues. Most of them had risen up and I sat on the appropriations committee. So I was always looking that we all had, that we spread our, our committees and got our most bang for the for the buck in the sense that so we, the Philly Republicans were on as many committees as we possibly could. No sense in duplicating. Uh, so finance was, as I said, mentioned Ben Wilson also sat right near me and it was a, 
and knowing taxes was an issue back home. So that was uh, always uh, an interest of mine. What were some of the issues that were important to you that, uh, that you tried to get some legislation passed? Uh, what the biggest issue was the uh, going back to the old Philadelphia State Hospital. Uh, uh, you know, when you hear this issue, all politics is local. What I found out early in my career, mm -hmm. I thought people paid attention to Harrisburg. I mean, my constituents. It really was another world to them. They, I mean, they came in for things, but had nothing to do with Harrisburg. I mean, which was the most enlightening thing to me uh, in the sense of I thought they'd be they would be worried about House Bill 2820 or and <laughs> rarely if never I mean did someone come through my district office uh, asking about a piece of legislation unless they were part of a special interest group if right. they were a nurse or a realtor or they really didn't know nor really care they knew I was an elected official uh, so my, they came through that door and it was most, I'd say 80% of my issues were local, yeah. uh, some federal, and they really didn't care what I was. They, they knew they were paying for my salary and they wanted me to address it. So, uh, so I was really free to uh, up here do, but if there was an issue back home, I would, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the appropriations, most were looking for money to, you know, weatherization programs or something, but it was always uh, back home related. Or the other issues were always related to the city of Philadelphia, school funding. Uh, but I always looked at those issues, okay, I'll help you city if city reinvests back in Northeast Philly. So they were always the, the way the issues evolved. Uh, I don't mind sending money downtown but getting back to this whole concept of secession was still like we liked some, there was still a movement to break away because they didn't feel they, they got their return on investment. So I always looked at issues from Harrisburg. Okay, we're, we're sending money to the school district or to these different agencies back home. What were you going to invest in, in Northeast Philly or in my district? So that's how most of the issues uh, evolved. With the closing of Byberry, Philadelphia State Hospital was known as Byberry, so there was always issues related to that in the sense of where were patients going to be placed or employment, uh, those type of issues. But everything was mostly local, and uh, I really focused uh, on local issues. One of the, uh, uh, the pieces <coughs> of legislation that you had introduced was House Bill 720 in 2007, known as the Clean Indoor Air Act. Um, was this something that was important to you uh, personally? Was this a constituent-based issue? Um, how did you get involved in that? The way that happened is I became the chairman of the health committee in like 2002. And that was really, I was urban affairs chairman. Uh, just a story, uh, as I said, Wogan became a judge. I convinced, uh, O'Brien to take his Consumer Affairs Committee at the time. Uh, then we choose new chairman by seniority. Mm -hmm. So what had happened is Health and Human Services opened up then. And I remember being at home one Friday and Matt Ryan, who was our leader, uh, called down and said, it's down to you. And I said, what's down to me? He said, no one wants this Health and Human Services Committee. And he said, would you be interested? And I said, oh, sure. You know, it's something, having a pharmaceutical background and uh, then John Taylor got uh, intergovernmental, and I didn't last long on. Uh, I kept urban, and John eventually got urban, so it worked out. So when I took over urban, I, we deal mostly with the government programs, Medicaid. And when I saw the cost of providing medical assistance to our low-income Pennsylvanians, uh, one of the drivers was smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, some of the statistics were overwhelming that smoking, I think the health care cost, just, just in our public sector, was about $4 billion. And it was a national movement, that, you know, smoking bans across the country. And uh, uh, I think Sue Cornell was one of the first members, probably a couple years prior to that, had taken up that cause. Okay. Uh, probably in 
I'll say 05 because I don't remember the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and Stu Greenleaf was a senator from Montgomery County who borders my district. He had introduced it in the Senate. So for her term, we tried to get that passed. I was the majority chairman. It was the only vote uh, in committee. We did bring it up. And I always said to my Democrat colleague, uh, Frank Oliver, you know, if we bring a bill up, it's to move it forward. It's mm -hmm. to, I remember bringing this, the smoking ban up when I was the chairman. Uh, it was a, you talking about every special interest group for and against up in the Ryan office building. Uh, and we had a roll call vote. And 14-14 <laughs> was the vote. Oh. It was the most. Uh, some members still think I purposely <laughs> wanted it 14-14 because there were people on both sides. Right. Of the, but Sue Cornell was an outgoing member at the time. Now, by the time we got around to the, she had been defeated in the primary. And I tried to get it done at least or for her behalf, but because uh, she was leaving, and uh, we just couldn't get it done. So what happened is a, a new session comes, and I thought it'd still be an, an important issue. Uh, so I did introduce it. Now I am now a minority chairman. Right. In '07, I was the majority chairman the, the prior session. Uh, what happened then is uh, Mike Gerber, uh, a freshman Democrat mm -hmm. from Montgomery County. The Democrats want to control the agenda and who gets what credit. So uh, I had introduced the same bill Sue, Representative Cornell had, but they wanted a Democrat to have it. So they gave Mike Gerber the legislation, to, uh, and we and we championed. I, you know, I didn't I didn't begrudge him. I knew it was an important issue to him, and uh, so I still mm -hmm. wanted it passed and signed into law, and, it, and uh, certainly. Uh, the votes in committee were always overwhelming. Uh, at, at you know when when Democrat Chairman Oliver brought it up, and uh, but it's an important issue. I think it makes sense, and uh, a healthier Pennsylvania. I think we'll we'll have from that. Absolutely. Um, in the last few years, you were named Legislator of the Year by the Arc of Pennsylvania for your and I'm quoting this: the tireless work on behalf of citizens with cognitive, intellectual, and developmental disabilities and their families. Um, this obviously was important to you. What uh, what's sparked this uh, interest? Was this also constituent based or a number? Yeah, I mean there were constituents that I would always um, and this whole issue of institutionalization, okay. dealing with the old Byberry. Byberry was closed. The old Philadelphia State Hospital was closed because there were advocacy groups. as going back into the 80s mm -hmm. that just said the mentally ill should not be just warehoused. And uh, so, but at the time, being a, a new legislator, it was a tough issue because it employed thousands of people. Right. Uh, we were at the time spending in like 30, uh, uh, I think it was like almost $39,000 per uh, patient in by huge number, like almost 60 some million dollars. Mm. I mean, so it was a huge economic engine. But over time, I just learned to agree, if you've ever visited us, at least Philadelphia State, there were documentaries on it. And mm -hmm. I began to s support the advocates say, you know, in human consciousness, how do we put people in these environments? And, and what I also found out is most of them were self-committed. Mm -hmm. Because history just said that's where we put these, uh, those that were mentally retarded, a lot of mentally retarded, not just mentally ill. Uh, and I'm talking about in the when we moved to Summer and going way back in the '60s, there were some five, six thousand mm -hmm. patients in Philadelphia State Hospital. At the time I took over in, in '80 as a legislator, there were some 500 and some patients, but still many of them shouldn't have been warehoused. Then, uh, so that issue grew my interest in institutionalization, because we do have centers across. Uh, they, they were mo predominantly mentally ill, the, mm -hmm. our Philadelphia State Hospital system. And then we do have institutions for our uh, mentally retarded. And as those advocacy groups started talking to me, and with the, the movement to a community-based system where uh, these community living arrangements, where these, uh, those with MR were able to function in the community with assistance. Uh, that whole movement started in the, 
in the 80s into the 90s, and we have really started to shut down our institutional. Um, so I became an advocate, and as you met parents that, I mean, really their fear was is they're aging in place. What they've always said to me is they never want their children to wind up in one of these institutions. They wanted to make sure uh, their children wind up in a community living arrangement out in the community. So I did take up that, especially as the, then when I become health chairman, I became more passionate because they are the least vulnerable of our citizens. I mean, they just, if the government should be stepping in and protecting and helping people, it's uh, those that are unable to help them protect themselves. So I became very involved with uh, those advocacy groups, mm -hmm. um, probably in, you know, more involved, I should say. Right. Uh, at, when I became the chairman and uh, really advocated for for programming and support for those families and especially those individuals, uh, ensuring that there was a system in place that protected uh, these citizens, especially knowing their parents are all growing older. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted them to make sure they were out in the community. And that's not politically correct all the time because uh, but that's how I became passionate about that issue and uh, uh, thought that's what government should be doing. Um, in dealing with your committee work and then the, uh, the House floor, uh, what obstacles did you come across uh, when trying to get some of your sponsored legislation passed? Uh, no matter what we spoke about, it always came down to money yeah. or somebody always had the money issue. And I will use one issue I asked one of my colleagues today on the we protect newborns to 18, mm -hmm. especially those with uh, disabilities. Uh, we have protective services for them. We have protective services for older adults from 60 on. There are laws in the books that give them special protection. The group we do not protect are 19 to 59. And, uh, one of the disappointments, uh, there was always a bill we moved out of committee, could never get it done, was the Adult Protective Services Act. Mm. That, and, we, and I'll give this as a sidebar. When we just did the puppy mill bill, which had national attention, how, how we had to protect, which I had no problem protecting puppies in the environment they live in, ensuring that they get proper service, nutrition, medical care, the environment they lived in was okay. It was interesting, the, I have one advocate back home said, you know, George, you have laws on the books to protect puppies, but you have no law on the book to protect a young adult from, an adult from 19 to 59. Yeah. And you start to, and I, you almost say you're kidding. And there is nothing that, all, that says, if you believe a, a, a person in that age range, mentally retarded, is being housed in a poor environment or not getting the medical attention. There's nothing you or I can do legally to knock on that door and say, we think yeah. you're, you're treating your son and do daughter or uh, your dependent if it's a custodial arrangement. There's nothing that says I can come in and look at, give me the medical records for that mentally retarded child. You legally can't do it and you start thinking, and I said to one of my colleagues, a Democrat colleague before I left, could you, get that done at some point soon. I said, I wish I could have time. And the first thing was money. And I said, you know, I have a $26 billion budget. If we can take care of puppies, and we certainly should be able to protect. And not that it goes on all, but not one person should be subjected or abused uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment where their health is threatened or they live in soil and soot and, and just are, uh, abused or neglected and that no human being should be in that position so uh, but money was always the getting <laughs> money is <laughs> always the obstacle that uh, it's going to cost money to to put that into place or to inspect uh, but i think that's something uh, we should do um did you find speaking on the the house floor comfortable never in all it's <laughs> fun, uh never back home uh it's an uh, getting back to my district very few, uh, uh, being from the city, you never, it was usually larger, uh, and I'll use the, the Lions. I mean, we don't have a Lions Club. We did for, but very small, very inactive, disbanded a few years ago. 
So you didn't have these lions luncheons to speak mm -hmm. at. I never had the forums back home uh, to speak at. Like I was not invited. Uh, it was only when I became a chairman later on in my career was I invited beyond my district mm -hmm. to speak on issues, school violence, we with those type of issues. Uh, and I was appointed to a couple special committees, uh, uh, the Urban School Restructuring Commission I sat on, where, where we traveled the state and got, we were outspoken then and we got to speak, but never in the environment where I needed to go to the House floor and, and spend uh, a lot of time uh, speaking on an issue. Uh, try to do all my work. Uh, uh, I mean, if you're gonna bring one of my bills up or, uh, you know, you knew the votes were there. I could, uh, but uh, speaking in public, I think is still something that uh, still I get nervous at and still, uh, so I was not a big, uh, not a big floor speaker or mostly in committee, one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, how, how did it feel to finally see some of your sponsored legislation be acts? Become, become, uh, it was good, but I got over them pretty quick. I mean, some people sitting, uh, it was something I was advocated for. Uh, it's always nice to hear people, they're a lot more important, I guess, in a funny way, hearing people describe and I'll just use this newborn screening was one of the last things we had done. Uh, the March of Dimes honored my, my, me and uh, Secretary of, uh, of Public Welfare, Estelle Richmond. And when she got up and spoke about me, I was almost, you know, and when the March of Dimes described me, it was like, oh, I, you know, it's pretty important stuff. But uh, I know it was important, but not to the, uh, these people live it every day. And it felt good. Uh, I mean, knowing you made, you made a difference, and that's, that's, that's a good feeling. Was there a typical session day, or were they all different? I think they were all different. I mean, there was, uh, during the budget season, they were like typical, sit and wait, sit and wait, sit and wait. Uh, but non-budget, I think they were all different. I mean, you had different issues most, most of the time. Uh, and usually if you went to caucus, you knew what to expect. Uh, but uh, sitting where we sat in the back, we had a great, uh, both D and R, we had, uh, we were away from the fray in the sense of, uh, we weren't down in the well speaking right. or our leaders spoke down in front. Uh, so we could have a lot of conversation, a lot of talk and chatter. And Speaking of which, how was the camaraderie uh, on the house. In the back? Oh, I thought it was, uh, uh, we always had a, as I said, it was always a small group in the back. I mean, uh, and I'm in the last several years, I mean, the very back. So you were the last, uh, <laughs> uh, and there's like special Democrats, I mean, would come over and we would just sit and shoot the breeze and talk about whatever. And uh, I was fortunate, Chairman Oliver, my Democrat, uh, counterpart in Health and Human Services was right there. So if we had an issue, I mean, he literally sat across the aisle from me. Our staffs would come down, we work on issues right there, resolve them uh, right on the floor. Uh, so that was always convenient, and, and Frank was always good to work with. Did you have a relationship, um, good or bad, with the media in your district? A, gr a good relationship with the, the local media. Uh, as our market being the Inquirer and the Daily News back home, they, we were like small potatoes. I mean, they really didn't uh, spend a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. um, if we were casting big votes up here, and I would say a tax vote or pro-life, say something that was controversial back home, that we would get maybe mentioned once or right. twice. You'd have the roll call vote or guns. Uh, but the local, the weeklies, great relationship. Uh, they were really a, an extension of our, our offices, really. I mean, because everything overlaps in a, in a city. There were so many legislators from the city. We overlapped media markets, so even the dailies. Uh, so they were an extension. They ran all our, off what was available in our offices. And they were consistent with what the other offices were doing. Sure. So, But it was a good relationship. Good. 
Um, over the years, you probably have seen a lot of technological uh, advancements, um, specifically laptops on the house floor for everyone, PC yeah. and the, the continual feed of the of the house sessions. Um, do you have an opinion on if that's too much or if that's if that's good? Oh, I think it's great. I, I really do think it's. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's instant contact now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is. Uh, I think something very positive for democracy and a civic lesson and for. For a legislator this way, you get answers. Uh, certainly the information is available to you to mm -hmm. develop an answer uh, or an opinion or uh, develop an issue. Uh, and your constituents have almost instant access. Uh, but yeah, I came here, there were no, we didn't have cell phones or mm -hmm. computers or, uh, you know, so everything was, I call home like once a night and that was my, find out what was going on with the family and the, uh, we called the district office, mm -hmm. but uh, it was all paper and legislation would sit on our desk. I mean, it was like thick and uh, I, think, I think this has been something very positive. Right. Over the well over 20 years that you've, you've been in office, what do you think was um, the most important issue or the, the most important piece of legislation that went before the House? I, as a pro-life legislator, I, I always, and, and just for my, I'll call it a compassionate conservatism, I, uh, I, I thought protecting life was always, in, uh, and, and it's not to say it has been controversial all those years too, but we uh, were probably one of the most uh, pro-life legislatures in the country and probably still are, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what led me to, you know, where government should, you know, stand up for the, the those that don't have a voice and uh, you know but I think the most contate, contentious issues were always those pro-life debates oh, sure. uh, and some some of the budget debates mm -hmm. over just uh, whether you were fiscally conservative or but I, I was always very uh, socially conservative uh, and I think they were the probably the most mm -hmm. Uh, contentious. What do you think is the toughest issue before the legislature today? I, I, I do believe it's uh, right now going to be getting uh, how do we deliver for our, our citizen the sense of uh, protecting the, the Pennsylvania's economy, mm -hmm. ensuring that there are jobs. Uh, and I think going forward, I think this whole benefits, people's insurance, I mean health benefits and their pensions, protecting uh, those those programs in the future I think are going to be the tough yeah. choices uh, into the, in, the, in, in the 21st century. Just it's going to be difficult because there's fewer resources, uh, money, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and there's a real fear out there I sense of that people are worried about their jobs but also those that have invested in their health care and their pensions, yeah. what's that future look like for them? And you hear so often now that people are now thought they could retire in a year or two are now thinking five years, and it's, it's frightening. And uh, when you look at our own pension fund as a state and future state uh, retiree, uh, I think we've lost like $10 billion in our pension fund over, it's a huge fund, but when you hear those numbers, you just say, wow. And I think that's going to be, we really have to get our house in order, just priority spending, ensure there's a balance of protecting those that retiring or near retirement, protecting pension, and at the same time trying to grow Pennsylvania's economy. Um, what was your, your, or I should say, what aspect of the job did you like the most? I think the people you, you, yeah. I, I got to meet. Not only back home, uh, uh, you know, I got to meet a lot of great mm -hmm. neighbors, and I, I called everyone neighbor because we're, I mean, relatively close. To, the district's very, right. not that large in the sense of uh, when you hear some of my colleagues travel 250 miles from one <laughs> end to the other, I had to maybe travel f five to seven miles now. But, um, but just the people you. Mm -hmm. uh, 
had the pleasure of meeting and interacting with. Was there a least favorite? I think the least favorite part of the job was I, I, I remember always leaving home thinking, oh, I got to go out to Harrisburg, spend two or three days. And I'd rather, you know, I'd rather stay home. And, uh, and then when you're out here, it's just being the disconnect uh, from back home. That was, that was the toughest part. Uh, uh, I understood somewhat what my constituents thought was another world because it really is another world that from Philly to coming to Harrisburg. And that, that was a tough, mm -hmm. people think it's, and it's a gorgeous building and the atmosphere is wonderful and the people are great. Uh, but it is still a lonely, I think a lonely, lonely job in the sense that you spend an awful lot of time uh, by your, not by yourself, but you know, with, you, you, you make new friends and uh, you know, you go out to dinner late just so, because the, the night it's over quick. Mm -hmm. So you stay in your office later, you go out to dinner later, so the day comes to an end quicker. I mean, uh, so that's what we did. But I think I think it's a lonely job. As great as the events we get and the people we get to meet, I think it's uh, it can be a lonely job too. You mentioned uh, the one issue earlier that was a somewhat of a disappointment that that you didn't get to work on on, on legislation for 19 to 59 year olds. Were there any other um, issues or, or pieces of legislation that you would have loved to have seen discussed or passed that you didn't necessarily get to? No, there's some uh, back home and I would say there's still some road issues and mm -hmm. uh, I have a Woodhaven Road project that's been on the books for over uh, probably 50, 1952 I think it started, so <laughs> like a 56 year old issue. Yeah. But something and I thought we were getting as close as we had been in uh, working with my state senator in Pendai. I thought we were finally going to get something, but that fizzled out at the end. But it was legislation that we've had on the books for, you know, in the, in the mm -hmm. funding plan, but never got a, still never got. And there is a, uh, a state park that is still not developed, uh, was first conceived in 1976. We put the funding in in 1999. Mm -hmm. Senator Salvatore and I, and that money has still not been spent. And it's those things that you, you wish you still had a little more time to get them done. And, and I hope, uh, you know, I'll see those things done. But now I'm trying to think if there's one issue that uh, stands out that I wish we uh, got to. Uh, it was one resolution that um, one of my last I think even today the bill was signed, Senate Bill 1114. I had language in there. Uh, I had one of our, uh, one of, a resident of my district, Stephen Lesbinski, a police sergeant in Philly, was killed in, in May, mm -hmm. May of this year, May 3rd. And uh, there was a resolution on the calendar memorializing him and thanking him for his service which we didn't get done, but at the same time, I didn't want it done in a way just to do it. I want it in a way where his, well, let me go back. In the legislation, I did get done uh, memorializing him along Route 73 through our district, uh, where there'll be a plaque, uh, mm -hmm. pen that will erect a sign at, uh, in memory of Police Sergeant Stephen Lesbinski that will be on Route 73 through his neighborhood in the Burholm section where he, he lived. So, as you enter Philly from Montgomery County on Cotman Avenue, there'll be that tribute through his, through that Cotman runs through Burholm, his neighborhood. So that got done. The one thing we didn't get done is where we bring the family up and memorialize him on the house floor. Mm -hmm. The resolution's on the calendar, but I did want it where my successor can, you know, come up, bring the family up next year and pay a, a tribute to him. and. Uh, and thank him for his sacrifice. I like to ask each of the members that I talk to mm -hmm. if they have a, a particular story that they would like to share that not necessarily a lot of people know that happened during the house, whether it's a funny story, um, a happy story, a sad story, uh, something really interesting um, that would that would be nice, you know, to have. Uh, 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 I don't know if it'd be one of the most, um, going back to the smoking ban, the, 
uh, the 14-14 tie. I think it was a uh, was neither the Democrat leader was against it and the Republican leader. So and uh, and the members were very uncomfortable. They'd rather us not bring this issue up. And I said, nah, I thought it important. And uh, I said to Chairman Oliver, are you ready? And the members, some of the members really weren't happy about it. They didn't want to upset anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, and we've, here we go. Yeah. But someone's going to be mad at the end of this. <laughs> uh, and I knew both leaders did not like it. And uh, so we, we percent the, the roll call starts and I'm we're, you know I'm walking along the way and I'm thinking oh my you know and uh, Chairman Oliver switched his vote to no so now I knew I was in real trouble <laughs> so it uh, it ends 14 14 and John Taylor who's sitting on the committee he said yo George 14 14 like you couldn't pull you. Yeah. You couldn't pull this off. How'd you do that? He says. He thought I actually did it on purpose, because he thought, let's have a tie vote. You know, nobody's nobody loses in the sense it's tie. I mean, we didn't defeat or win. You know, and I still to this day I think he thinks I arranged it that way. <laughs> and there was a line Edgar Carlson going back to who I first started. He always I remember him saying a line. George, some of your friends are for it, some of your friends are against it, you're always for your friends. So John Taylor says to me, yo, George, he said, how'd you pull that off? And I, like I knew what I was doing, said, hey, John, some of our friends were for it, some of our friends were against it, we were for our friends. And he just burst out laughing. But he really thought it was an orchestra, and it really wasn't. I was trying to get the bill passed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the majority chairman. but. I think to this day believes I had it down to a perfect everyone. No one could be mad because no one lost, mm -hmm. no one won. Hey. But that's uh, that's how good I was as a chair. There you go. <laughs> uh, why are you leaving the house? Uh, decided no five to leave the house. I told my leadership back home. Uh, told uh, uh, John Purzell. I was in the day before, th a year ago, it was the day before Thanksgiving in 05. I said, John, I have, uh, now Liz and I have had six, I don't think there's any legislature in modern time that had, has had six children. I came here single, <laughs> and I don't think there's anybody had six children wow. going back for, I don't know, you can go back in the history mm -hmm. book, I don't think we've ever, but Liz and I were, I was married in my first term, and we had six children. Uh, Caroline, our oldest, is deceased, but so I have five children now for uh, 21, 19, 17, 14, and 6. Mm. All with the same woman. <laughs> and my wife said to me, and we were talking, I mean, it, you know, it's more competitive back mm -hmm. home. It's a t I'm a Republican in a Democrat city. It's, we're down to like three Republicans out of the, we're, as when I started, there were six yeah. of us. So I decided, Liz and I sat down, I said, look, I, she said, you can stay with, you, need, you know, we need money. And we had just, the pay raise, mm -hmm. we just had that fiasco. So we knew there was no more money ever going to be made. Uh, I did not have, I wasn't a lawyer or have a family business where some, I had an income where someone could, right. Liz was working like three jobs. So I decided in 05, I go to leadership, I said, I'm, I, I'm not running in 06. So they said, please. Don't tell anybody. Mm. Also, January comes of 06, and I call my party leader back home, and John Perzell, and I said, yo, remember, I'm, yo, because you had to file, like, in February. Mm. I said, I'm not running. Well, I said, George, it's a little late now, isn't it? So I wind up running in 06. So then, now my wife says, you know, we, we didn't even, I mean, financially, uh, uh, five tuitions, two in college, two in high school, one in grade school. So I made the decision very public, like in 07. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> publicly went out. I'm not running. Uh, I had a great 24 years. It was, 
just time for me to, uh, financially I needed to, to help my family and my, my wife has these three part-time jobs and it's just, we just need, it was just time too. So I think it was just, uh, you just know and you sense when, when it's your time to move on and uh, it was my time and uh, uh, mostly financial but I just wanted, I, I was young, I came in a young man, uh, 24 years later, leaving a young man, uh, 51, will start a new career uh, back home. I hope to, you know, hope to stay involved in the sense of uh, the governor has reached out to me, as a, even as a Republican, to say we just serve in some capacity, whether it be on a commission or a board. And I, he's coming up with some ideas, so I said I would look at them. I said I don't want to come at the most a month, one day a month to serve. Hopefully I can be back home. Uh, with my advocacy on some of the issues, uh, I've been asked to be on a couple statewide boards, Good. but I don't want to commit to something I can't give them the, the and I've said to a couple of these boards that I, they, they like just having a former legislator on board. And uh, I said, but uh, I don't want to do it just to put my name on it and not participate. I, I really want to be involved. So, So hopefully I'll stay involved and I'll be involved back home. How would you like your tenure in the House to be remembered? Uh, uh, George Kenny uh, uh, was always a gentleman, served his constituents uh, honorably. He was, uh, uh, some people don't like the term, but he was a, 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 a nice guy and respected, and respected the institution and respected those he served with. Good. Final question for you. What advice would you have for new members? New members, I would I would stay uh, pick a couple issues or a committee and just uh, stay focused on a couple issues and become the the best at those issues, knowing the most about that issue pro and con, uh, and articulating them and and becoming passionate about them, and never forgetting where you came from, never forgetting home. Uh, because as important as we think we are up here, uh, you know, back home, we're, 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 we do represent uh, our neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, but we still have a, an obligation to, to hear them. They come first, not the special interest in Harrisburg. Their issues come first. Your, their neighborhood, you know, your neighborhoods back home come first. Uh, and, and just don't forget that. And uh, I think any freshman can uh, you know, have a great career here um, and do great work. I, even my, my, I'll have a Democrat replacing me, but uh, I wish him the best, advocate for our communities, and if uh, he's advocating for our communities, I think uh, he'll do fine. Good. Representative George Kenny, I'd like to thank you very much for participating in our oral history program and for sharing your stories with us today. Thank you. And good luck with everything you do. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much.